All right, we're recording. You can go ahead. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the TSO committee meeting on this Thursday evening. Thank you for joining us. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. <clears throat> Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. So with that, I'd like to call the meeting to order and be sure that everyone can uh, hear and be heard. And we can see everyone, so I'll start with the uh, committee. So, uh, Andy. Yes, I'm here. Anna. Present. Jelani. I'm here. Okay, we'll move on. Athena. I'm here, thanks. Paul. Oh. Here. Okay. Chief Livingstone. I'm here. Thank you. Darcy Dumont. Here. John Root. I'm here also. Hello, welcome. And Kelly, can you hear us, Kelly? Yes, I can. You sound great. Okay, thank you. All right, so we will move on to public comment. If we have anyone with us in the audience, oh wait, I'll pause. Sarah, can you hear us and make sure we hear you? Hi, everyone. How you doing? Welcome. Thank you. Phenomenal. Okay. So we'll go ahead. Uh, do we have anyone with us in the audience who would like to make a public comment? Please raise your hand if so, so we can bring you in. Okay, John Root, go right ahead. Yes, so um, I need slides for this. This is, oh, uh, perhaps I should be waiting for uh, for later and rather than calling this public comment. So I'm, I'm not ready yet. Yeah, if it has to do with your, with your presentation, yes, please. Right. <clears throat> okay, so I cannot see Athena. Did we have anyone from the no, audience? Okay. No, no hands in the attendees. Okay, thank you. So with that, uh, we are going to move on to appointments followed, filed, excuse me, appointments filed with the town clerk for the Recreation Commission. Uh, Paul, would you like to walk us through and tell us about the appointees? Sure, so there are two appointments that I'm putting forward to you tonight, both for the Recreation Commission. Uh, Jonas Cox, who lives at 70 Hillcrest Place, um, has been, uh, working in multimedia webcasts and things like that for 25 years. But more importantly, he's uh, as a sports and recreation enthusiast um, ever since he was young and now continues to organize um, Amherst youth with soccer. Um, they've, he's coached youth soccer. He's uh, developed uh, summer leagues. Um, he understands all the pieces that you need to know about what it takes to schedule fields, to put a team together, to communicate with parents. So he's going to be a terrific addition to the Recreation Commission. The second person is Jean Janicki, who lives on Memorial Drive. Um, she has a lot of experience in in other communities, actually, and, and has and wants to bring that experience to Amherst. Um, she uh, identifies as bicultural, bilingual, and wants to really expand the offerings for the town of Amherst uh, to access more communities than actually participate at this point in time. So these are the two appointments I hope that you'll support. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion. All right, uh, I move to recommend to the town council, the town manager appointments of Jonas, Ch Jonas Cox and Jean Janicki to the Recreation Commission with terms to expire June 30th, 2025. Steinberg second. Thank you. Go ahead and, and call the vote, Shalini. Yes. Andy. Yes. 
Anna. Yes. And I am a yes, so that is a four with one absent. Thank you. Really Thank you. quickly, um, Anna, could you read me that motion just one more time? Sure can. I even wrote it down today. <clears throat> yes, I love uh, it. <laughs> uh, move to recommend to the town council the town manager appointments of Jonas Cox and Jean Janicki to the Recreation Commission with terms to expire June 30th, 2025. You got it or you want another one? With terms to expire. June 30th, 2025. Got it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anna and Kelly. I just want to take a moment to, uh, Dorothy has joined us. Just want to make sure, Dorothy, that we can hear you and you can hear us. Um, I can, but I will tell you, I, I clicked on the link Athena sent and it sat there, didn't move. I went and found another email from Athena and clicked on that one. So I've been sitting there trying to come in through official entries. What, what did I do wrong? It may have been the wrong invitation, Dorothy. I'm I'm sending a lot because we have so many special meetings coming up. So I'm um, I'm sorry if that that was confusing. But well, you're here they, now, I and I'm glad. They did say TSO and to today's date, so I which was kind of weird. So how did you guys get in? What was because obviously what I did wasn't right. The you same way through the email. Yeah. Yeah. Same through the email. So the last one that Athena sent today. That's the link I used. I, that was my second link. Okay. All right. Just was okay, well, we're glad that you're here. And okay. So with that, we will move on and welcome Sarah Barr, advisor to the Provost and Campus Initiatives and Director of Community Engagement at Amherst College. Thank you for coming by to chat with us this evening. And um, will you need a screen share? I'm not going to need a screen share, although I might at some point decide to reference the internet. Um, <laughs> so for now, I think I'm okay. <laughs> okay, um, the floor is yours. I am so happy to be here with all of you tonight. And um, my understanding is that TSO plays a very particular role in the town. And so I'm looking at the website right now. And so your responsibility is to attend to matters concerning the day-to-day -day provisions of services, by the Amherst government and relations between the town and the community, giving attention to the meeting of the council statement of values, particularly those of diversity, equity, inclusion, environmental sustainability, fiscal responsibility, as well as ensuring that measures foster an unbiased and inclusive environment that is free of discrimination, harassment, and negative stereotyping towards any person or group. Is that correct? That's what they tell us. Okay, so there are so many things that I can talk about, but I, I think what I really want to focus on are the really um, positive connections between the college and the town, um, particularly the different town departments, um, and then also some of the ways that you may or may not know that folks can um, get involved in Amherst College and come to public events. So I'm in a relatively new role at Amherst College, although I've been here for 15 years, um, which is kind of uh, wild. Um, but over time, I've been involved in internship programs here. So getting students out to local community sites like the Amherst Survival Center and the Hitchcock Center and the Eric Carl Museum. Um, I worked with faculty who make connections between the town um, and the college. So helping students link learning inside and outside of the classroom. Um, right now, I think we have 20. Um, community-based learning courses. Um, there are some particularly hot ones right now uh, working with the Amherst Public Schools. Uh, there is a pair of faculty members working with all of the fourth graders at Wildwood on an indigenous narratives class. And so there is a book club between the college students and the fourth graders. Um, and they're learning about the ways in which uh, students uh, may or may not see indigenous authors and illustrators. And so the college students are going to the Eric Carl Museum with the fourth graders. And ultimately um, the students are gonna write their own uh, children's books. So really trying to contribute to overall um, the conversations around indigenous literature. There's another group uh, of two faculty members that are working with the Family Center um, at uh, Amherst Public Schools and thinking particularly about college access. So we've had our students going to the middle school and the students are coming here to Amherst College. So really trying to like help build connections between our students and the students in the public schools. Um, kind of thinking more broadly about sort of the other kinds of partnerships that we have. Um, I've got a Spanish class working with the Jones Library. So thinking about bilingualism and um, 
kids and storytelling, um, the Spanish department um, is actually amazing and working with um, the dual language program in the public schools and trying to connect with CRESS and the DEI department to think about translation. Um, I see Scott Livingston on this call and I know that John Carter um, and is a good partner uh, for you all as well. So it really is department by department trying to figure out how to connect um, the talents of town employees with the talents of Amherst College employees to make good things happen. Um, one of the things I want to mention is that, um, I don't know if you remember, we had this pandemic um, and it kind of made everything extra super weird. And I think what I heard from a lot of members in the community was that there was a lot of appreciation for Amherst College creating a bubble. Do you remember the bubble? Do you know that the students may have wandered outside of the bubble on occasion? Um, anyway, I, I think that everyone tried very hard um, because we're a residential community, I mean, 97% of the students live on campus. So we really had to pay a lot of attention to public health issues and kind of keeping the students safe because a number of them couldn't go home. Um, and what happened um, by creating that bubble is I think that we lost a lot of the connections that we had before the pandemic. So one of the things that I think we're really working on is like, how do we reestablish relations? How do we help students get to know their neighbors? Um, how do we help um, Amherst College town members remember that we're here and get connected. Um, and so there were also some other weird things that happened. Um, the Mead Art Museum was like closed for a year because there was a structural problem with the steeple. <laughs> and so um, I'm happy to report that everything is pretty much open and, and everyone is welcome. So I've, I've actually been to the Mead Art Museum a number of times lately. Um, if you haven't been, it is free. There is an amazing James Baldwin exhibit. Um, there's this really cool exhibit called Black Art Matters where um, black students have contributed art um, and it's been curated in the museum. And so it is a really special opportunity to see student artists in a museum. Um, Bineski is still there and they're getting a wild amount of traffic. So the dinosaurs are there, the dinosaur tracks, like please come by. Um, Emily Dickinson is back open. Um, the athletic program is great because there's lots of free opportunities for people to go to sporting events. Uh, I mean, the list goes on um, for ways that people can get connected. I've been trying to do a better job of posting public lectures to the public calendar in town. So if anyone has signed up for, um, what, is the, what is it called? The special communications? You all are signed up for it, right? And ours the town. I'm sorry, on, on the town the website? On listserv. And so you can you can post things on the on the town calendar and they get sent out on the listserv. So we're trying to do a better job of um, pushing communication out and staying connected. Um, and then there are fun things too in the sciences. We did astronomy night in the fall and so welcomed. Um, it was particularly targeted to middle schoolers so they could learn about the cosmos. Um, but we had the telescopes on the roof of the Science Center open so people could see Jupiter. Um, we had a portable planetarium set up in the lobby so people could go and like have a planetarium experience. Um, there's this great program called Mass Mammal Watch. I don't know if any of you have bears in your yard, but you can totally like track bears and report it and be a part of this massive citizen science project that's tracking bear movement um, in Amherst and beyond. So. There's just lots of cool ways in which um, we're connected. The, the Mass Mammal Watch is one of my favorite uh, programs because I've had a bear in my yard and it kind of um, is overwhelming when that happens. But we've partnered with eight local schools. And so there are kids that have access to trail cams. And so kids in the science classrooms get to go through the trail cam footage and then contribute that science to this broader um, tracking of bears and other mammals in Massachusetts. So lots of different ways to get connected. Um, I would be very curious if there are things that you think that we could do to help um, folks know um, of the resources that are available here, or if there are ideas for partnership projects. Um, that's certainly a thing that I would love to learn more about. Dorothy, I see your hand up. Yes, well, because I have subscribed to a concert series at various times at Amherst okay. College, I get emails. Uh, telling me about music activities. But what I don't get emails on um, are plays. And I love to attend oh. plays. I'm finally at the high school. It was like, you could never find out what the show was. But now that they used Eventbrite to sell tickets, 
Eventbrite somehow keeps your name in there and sends you notifications. There's a play and when it's going to be. And I would love to be, because I, I did get to one play production of yours in the powerhouse, but it was mm -hmm. just a total accident. And, yep. you know, I'd love to be able to participate more with the arts at Amherst. And I did see the museum um, exhibit. It was wonderful. Um, and I heard about the uh, science, the uh, telescopes on the roof. And I thought, oh, I wish I'd known that, but I, I didn't know about it in time. So and, that and we're trying to be better about it. So, so there is actually an Arts at Amherst email listserv, and so I can email that to you so that you can sign up for it. But it's it's a go to source for all of the galleries, um, all of the arts, all of the music events. Um, but does it have theater events? It, theater events too. It's all of the arts. So arts, theater, yeah. dance, music, all of the things. So that's right. that's usually a great source. So I'd be happy to send that information to you so you can sign up for that newsletter. Thank you, thank you. Anika. Yes, I just wanted to share, uh, Dorothy, the astronomy night was pretty great. And uh, <laughs> that that was great. I've, and I've also made my rounds to the, uh, that I shared last week to the Mead Museum. That was uh, great and um, and I'm ready for others. So. There's, there's a Brit, there were two opening art openings on campus tonight. And so I actually went to an event at the Mead and everyone was kind of splitting off because there is a new exhibit in the Russian Cultural Center. So Amherst College has this very unusual collection of, of Russian texts and art. Um, and so that's beautiful. And then there was another art opening in um, the art building. So really sweet, amazing um, art to see. Andy. Well, the only thing I was gonna add, Sarah, thank you. Um, there is one thing that we did a few years ago. We have a sister city in Japan, Kanagasaki, and uh, it, they <clears throat> every year had been sending junior high school students to, to do homestays in Amherst, and we try and come up with activities that are would give them an introduction to Amherst and to um, just life here. And in the last visit, uh, we did an informal thing that I put together with a visit to the Vineski Museum and lunch at Valentine, and it was very successful. And I think that it actually could be expanded to give them a little bit more flavor of what a college is like in the United States, um, because I think it's a very friendly place to do it. So if we're able to pull this off this year, it has been suspended for several years, because of the pandemic. Um, I am in contact with Kanagasaki. And uh, if there's gonna be an exchange this year, I will, we will get in contact with you. Please do. And and I all of the conversations that I've had with the folks at Bineski, Emily Dickinson and the Mead um, have consistently said like, please send people our way. You know, we're happy to give tours. We're happy to make connections. Like folks on campus very much want to build relationships with you and, and make the, the resources that are on campus accessible and welcoming. Shalini. Hi, you actually pronounced my name perfectly. That's so unusual and nice. Uh, okay, so uh, listening to all the ways that students are participating with uh, schools and libraries, I was wondering if they might be interested in interning with uh, with town council or some of our committees um, in terms of research. One area we oh, yeah. always like look, we're always wanting to do research. And so if they're, and there's, you know, they, you can look at our different committees and uh, they can go to the website and see what each committee does. So if they have interest in zoning, planning, you know, urban design, or so that would be the CRC, our town, uh, TSO is more around services, quality of services, safety, inclusion, you know, those kind of things, or so that's one area of uh, where we could benefit. And, uh, and similarly with faculty as well, you know, when we have openings, could we send them to you? Uh, and then you could forward it maybe like, you yeah, know, absolutely. because there's, I mean, there's so many, before I joined council, I had no idea how our town runs and I could have been, I was pretty clueless and having joined, it's just created such a another level of involvement, belonging, respect for our staff, for our town. And so I think it's just such a great opportunity for people that they may not even know exists. Uh, so 
So would you be the person we send it yeah. out? And we actually have two students serving on committees right now. So there's a student that's serving on the Arts Commission and another student that's on the Human, Human Rights, Rights Commission. Yes, yes. And, and we actually post the vacancies on the CCE's website. So um, I did hear that we're about to push again for like vacancies on committees. And so that's an easy thing that we can do. But if there are specific technical skills that folks need or area of expertise, like, you know, absolutely committed to making those things visible. Um, one of the... Um, I'm, I'm actually meeting with the head of the student newspaper tomorrow morning, and this is one of the stories that I want to pitch to him because I think that there are going to be um, a lot of students that are interested in that. It's worth men mentioning that we've had students do research projects for different groups. So a couple of years ago, there was a student who worked with John Hornick on affordable housing um, and was doing research. So Amherst College students are, are very good at research, and sometimes it comes in the form of an internship. Um, sometimes we do class projects. So Spanish Senior Seminar, it's translation projects with community partners. Um, but the other thing we have as a resource is federal work study money. And so there are federal work study students that work at the Jones Library right now. Um, and, I, and we've had some conversations with other departments as well. So I think there's, again, we're sort of relearning how to be connected because during the bubble times, no one was allowed off campus. And so the tradition of those jobs and those relationships kind of um, went away as seniors graduated. So I think we're in this time of, of rebuilding, but, but Shalini, I 100% agree. Like there's opportunities to intern, to do research um, and to support government. We actually had one intern that got a job after graduation in the IT department in town. Um, so, so there is a history of doing this, but, but again, we're out of practice. <laughs> so, so part of it is like, how do we, how do we get back into the, the zone there? I know, I hear you. And and most of our meetings are still on Zoom. So hopefully it's easy and convenient for them to participate. And also you're two two blocks down the road. Oh, that's true. I <laughs> mean, like you could actually like kind of cross, I mean, like three or four buildings and you you hit an Amherst College dorm. Um, so it is it is super close. Can I just uh, share one other question? Ask one other question then. Uh, so also there are a lot of fun things happening now downtown, like in terms of Drake's, the music scene, or, uh, you know, in summer we have the jazz series of music and on the, and, and, and the comments. Is there a way for students to know about what's happening in town? Yeah, and so the communications department at Amherst is trying to help move that message around. And so the block party was actually the first time that we've been back in like semi-normal times. And so like Amherst students were really excited to go out and you could tell that they were the students because they had little purple lanyards on. Um, and so I think that there's been a lot of that action in town. I actually had dinner um, at one of the restaurants and as I was walking to my car, I saw a pair of students in their Amherst college gear. So they're, they're definitely around. Um, one of the, I, I serve on the board of both the bid and the chamber in my, oh, yeah. and so I'm trying to like really sort of say like, okay, how do we make sure we push this information? So is it posters? Is it social media? Um, yeah. But, but again, it's, it's new, it's new um, habits that need to be developed. Okay. Um, and, and if you, if you watch Amherst College's social media, we're trying to like post and repost um, opportunities. So absolutely. Awesome. And they can perform at Drake's too. Yes, so and they have. And we and, and yeah, the Drake, uh, it's I was talking to one professor who had assigned um Drake concerts as a as a class assignment. So go and see live performance and write about it because you know you can you can theorize about music, but it's very different to watch performance. And you know, what he is was saying is that he discovered that the students just kept going back time and time again because they love it. Um, I also discovered that Amherst College students can go to Amherst Cinema for free. So, so we have paid for tickets and made that a resource that's available. So, so I think that we're really trying to like drag or dr like drive traffic into downtown businesses. Um, there's a program called um, Typo and Tyso, which is take your professor out to lunch or take your staff out to lunch. And so um, students can like pick a staff member and take them out to a couple of different restaurants. And so that program is restarted so they can go to Mexicalito or Fresh Side. Um, they just added um, Bistro 63. So again, we're trying to grow those connections so that students can get, you know, lunch with their professor and then tell their friends about it and go back at another time. Can I pause one second and tell you about our students? Because I, um, 
I forgot to ask how long you all have been in town. Um, I mentioned that I've been here 15 years since 2008. But uh, for those of you who have been here longer, the, the demographics of the student body have changed pretty dramatically. So Amherst has been around for 200 years. Um, it was a men's college up until the 1970s. Um, but right now, uh, we just admitted the class of 2027, which makes me feel my age in kind of an uncomfortable <laughs> way. Um, but what uh, we did in admitting these students is 60% of the incoming class are domestic students of color. 21% um, identify as first-generation college students. 12% um, are international students coming from 54 different countries, um, as well as 49 of the United States and the District of Columbia. So when we talk about the Amherst student body, it is truly this amazing diversity of students that are coming from all over the planet. So when you go to see a student performance or you go to see you know, students share their art for Black Art Matters, they are truly coming from all over. So it is um, you know, from a, a DEI perspective, like please come over and meet the students and, and talk with them. And you know, it's, a, it's a pretty um, pretty special place in that way. It's also worth noting that I think 60% of our students are on financial aid. Um, and so Amherst is one of the only schools in the country that is need blind um, and does not package loans. So when you graduate from Amherst College, you are not graduating with a mountain of debt, that there is this real commitment to full access um, and just ensuring that students can come to Amherst College to have a great education um, and then leave without student loans. Thank you so much, Sarah. Are there any other questions for Sarah? Anna. Not a question. I just want to thank you. I think I think this is so exciting to have this level of engagement. Um, I think it's not necessarily something we've seen in, in quite this way before. And I, I really think it speaks volumes, not just to your work, but to you know the, the efforts to really make this an ecosystem. I think it was one of the things I remember talking about when we were talking about the UMass Chancellor was that it takes intentionality to not just exist around each other. And so I really appreciate the, um, that you and, and the college are, are making that intentional effort and hopefully we will <clears throat> meet you right back in it. So appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Dorothy. Um, for many years, since we, we moved here 13 years ago, I went to the Co Festival and participated in the you know the performance workshops, and that meant I was on Amherst College campus for a good number of weeks in the summer, and I would see high school student groups mm -hmm. coming and clearly you had a whole array of programs. Yes. But I don't know if any of those were Amherst town of Amherst students, and what I'm asking you is to think about having more programs like that for mm -hmm. students in this town for them to come in and get a, a good idea of what the college is like. Sure. Um, so um, I think the athletic camps have been very popular for Amherst residents. So the, the athletics department and the coaches put on tons of sports clinics. So, so I think that is the place where mostly it's, it's local folks. Um, I don't know if you read that we are um, have started the uh, the infrastructure work for the geothermal system. So we've kicked off our climate action plan. So this summer, a significant portion of the campus is actually gonna be offline because it's getting mm -hmm. retrofitted for geothermal because we're trying to be mm -hmm. climate neutral by 2030. So um, my understanding is that there will be a limited number of campers. Right. This summer, it will be Thrive, which are students that are um, low-income first-generation students like getting ready for college. Um, I feel like tennis was the other one. Um, we had those. We we have those in Amherst. I just want to make sure that yeah. And oh, Great recruited. Books is the other one. So Alon Stobbins, who's an Amherst resident, does the Great Books program. And so um, that's that's sort of the other the other summer program. We also have about six hundred students who are on campus during the summer. So we're we're kind of leaning into being a three hundred and sixty five day a year campus. Mm -hmm. So that's also a pretty significant change because when I first started, there were only about eighty students on campus. Mm -hmm. Um, so big change. I, we did, um, have students that interned with the rec department over the years. So we, we've had students, um, do internships and, and work study there as well. But I, I totally hear what you're saying in terms of, of camps for kids. Absolutely. Thank you. Anna, I think you're next again. I'm next again. It's because I thought I didn't have a question and now I do. Okay. Um, so I, I think as I was thinking about ecosystem, I was thinking about, um, 
you know, intentional partnerships. And I'm, I'm curious if there have been ways that folks have explored things like, you know, as, as we know, one of the things we've really been navigating as a town is our lack of playable field space. And so regardless of what solution the town comes to, I'm curious, I know Amherst College has a couple turf fields, a couple grass fields. And so I'm right. curious if conversation has happened or is happening, and maybe this is a Paul question, maybe this is a Sarah question, about sharing resources in that, physical resources, I'll, I'll rephrase, um, in terms of field space, in terms of facilities, things like that. Um, and if there are examples of that that you can share, I'd love so, to hear. Sure, so, so this has come up and I um, was told, and I can't remember if it was by someone at the high school or someone at Amherst College, that the, the use of the fields in terms of when the Amherst College students and the high school students would need them don't align. So that the Amherst College fields are used intensely at the same time that the high school students or the other students would wanna use them. So that's not to say no, I mean, I'm, I'm certainly happy to go back to athletics and see what the possibilities are, but, but my impression from the athletics department Think at the high school was that it's not it's not an easy kind of like oh we'll just use those fields it's because they're playing on them at the same time that that the like baseball is baseball season yeah 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 um thank you i appreciate that it's been looked into yeah absolutely paul you're next well, we would always look into that more sarah yes. uh, <laughs> <laughs> as i'm sure it's not one-to-one -one alignment so uh, i just went to uh, so shout out to my alma mater. So you mentioned the Co Theater Festival, which was started by a Hampshire alum, Sabrina Hamilton, who ran it for so many years. So we, all of our colleges contribute in many different ways and do want to just um, note for the committee that um, Sarah's done a tremendous job of connecting with town officials um, across the board. And is just a real um, a person who is a real strong connector and delivers on what she says she's going to deliver on. So we really appreciate what you're doing, Sarah. So thank you. Thanks, Paul. I mean, I, I hope you all know how much I care about the town. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, I lived in town for a number of years behind Mission Cantina. Um, I owned the little brown house back there. Um, and then I fell in love with someone who has a kid and he lives in Northampton. And then I married him. And so I moved out of Amherst for love. And so like, I love Amherst, I love Chris Moore. So I just, my heart, my heart is with you all. You um, sure? <laughs> yes, Anna, I'm sure. I'm just kidding. Um, but but I, I, I also want to just sort of express the, the generosity of the, the town staff that I've met with. I mean, I, um, you know, I've gotten a tour of the DPW um, and Guilford has helped me understand like all of the different departments in the DPW and what they do. And I'm so appreciative of their work. Um, you know, fire department, um, I go to the Campus Community Coalition for Iris Drinking. Dorothy, is that the name of the committee? Um, and I have just been so impressed by the ways in which, you know, the towns of, of Amherst and Hadley and UMass and Amherst College, um, everyone's working together. I mean, it's a it's a pretty great place to be. And so um, I'm thankful every day for the partnership. I'm thankful for the great folks that work in the town and I'm pretty optimistic and excited about our future together. Thank you so much, Sarah. I love that. And it, well, we have one more. We have another. I Towards just ask Paul whether this is a time to um, ask about Amherst College and land for more affordable and accessible housing. You can ask that question and I'll answer that question if you'd like. Is that okay if I if I feel that Go question? for it. Go for it. So, so um, I think you all know that we got a new president last August and we're getting a new chief financial and administrative officer on Monday. So um, Mike Thomas, who is the new chief financial and administrative officer has been working for Middlebury for a number of years and has done a number of projects both in California and in Vermont. So part of um, what I think we're looking for as a college are, like, are exciting projects and ways to partner together with the town. Um, the president has said that the priorities are uh, sustainability, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, economic development, and public education. And what I've heard from the town is that public safety and affordable housing are sort of the other priorities. So these are the six things that I think we have shared value around. So um, the new guy starts Monday. I think that uh, it's definitely something to be thinking about. 
but I don't want to make promises that we're going to do this because, you know, the, it's the kind of stuff that would involve the trustees. So um, I think there is, again, excitement about partnership and ways that we might build and create things together. Is that Thank a fair you. enough answer, Dorothy? It's a, it's a great answer. Okay. And um, I just also want to say how is your wonderful addition to the CCC, which is the Community and Campus <laughs> Coalition. It rounds out the town and it's yeah. really so, so thank you. And it's a great partnership. I mean, it's just, um, it's really wonderful to see the ways people work together. And if you have ideas for projects or partnerships, and, and I know that you all are focused on the town, um, but we have lots of, of partnerships with local nonprofits like the Emerge Survival Center. So I was on the board there um, as the board president for a number of years. Um, connecting with ancestral bridges. And so really thinking about the racial history of the town and celebrating black and Afro-Indigenous community members. Um, you know, there's there's so many possibilities. And, and you know, to be honest, like sometimes it's, it's a, a mismatch. And so sometimes the students wanna do something and I can't find a partner or the timeline doesn't work out. But, but I think, you know, if you are in a good relationship and you kind of talk things through, you, you find out ways to make things work. So please, please, please be in touch. Um, I'm in Converse Hall, which is like three blocks from Town Hall. So feel free to stop by any time or drop me a note, okay? Thank you so much, Sarah. We really appreciate you being with us and being so flexible to join us uh, this evening and definitely look forward to continuing the conversation with you. Fantastic. And hopefully I'll see you on campus and I know I'll see you all in town, okay? Absolutely. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, that was lovely. Okay, so now I am going to hand over the floor to Shalini, Darcy Dumont, and John Root uh, for their uh, presentation on the proposed amendments to bylaw 3.33 and the zero waste Amherst presentation. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anika, and welcome, John. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm going to pause. We have Paul. Yeah, could I just ask a time question? Uh, I know Chief Livingstone is here. Are you allowing, how much time are you allowing for this discussion so he can go do something else while this is going, if he doesn't? Yes, please, thank you for saying that. And I, and I do, I want to apologize, um, Chief Livingstone. I, I was not aware you'd be with us, or I would have put you ahead as this is a, you know, probably a shorter agenda, but we will have, uh, the zero waste Amherst Hills and Shalini have 45 minutes, so it will be it will be a hard stop. So that is what is it? So oh, 45 minutes, you figure? Yeah, and we will we'll be we'll be staying to that time. Okay, though, sounds good. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so welcome Darcy and John. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for all the work you've been doing with the community in terms of education and. Um, and so today you are here to present the, the findings from a survey that you did uh, to gather information. I'll just let you do the presentation and share what, yeah, what was the purpose of that uh, presentation uh, of the survey and what were your findings? Okay, I'm gonna screen share and let's hope it works. Uh, let's see. Um, okay. Does that look good? Okay, yes. come on, John. Yes, uh, Zero Waste Amherst is pleased to be able to share the data from our trash recycling and compost survey, as well as data that was shared with us last week by USA Waste and Recycling. We were initially requested by our partners to conduct the survey, in particular to ascertain the costs of these services since this information had previously been unavailable. Our members devoted a considerable amount of time to preparing and administering the survey, analyzing the data and preparing this presentation. As your committee is aware, this information is being provided to move forward the proposal to amend our town's solid waste uh, bylaw that would require the town to contract with a hauler through a competitive bidding process, uh, provide a townwide compost pickup and local compost processing, and implement a pay as you throw uh, fee structure. The intention of this bylaw is to dramatically reduce waste and its associated 
pollution and emissions and to reduce waste and recycling costs for residents as well. Uh, uh, as the uh, former chair of the town's Recycling and Refuse Management Committee, uh, I'm delighted to be, be participating in this process. The, the Zero Waste Amherst Bylaw proposal under consideration is entirely consistent with proposals contained in the Solid Waste Master Plan that our committee submitted to the Select Board six years ago. Uh, I'll go through all the slides and would ask that you save your questions and comments for the end of the presentation. We reached out to a number of organizations and individuals in an attempt to have a representative sample of Amherst homeowners to gather this information. We also asked respondents about their current usage of the transfer station. We were delighted with the community's response to our survey. 510 people filled it out. 450 of these were homeowners. 69% of these homeowners contract with the hauler to handle their waste and recycling. About half of respondents purchase transfer station passes for an annual fee of $125. Approximately one third of respondents who contract with the hauler also purchase transfer station stickers for that additional $125 fee. So hauler service, the, this section of our presentation analyzes data about hauler services gleaned from both our survey and information that was recently shared with us by USA Waste and Recycling. Zero Waste Amherst survey results suggested that home homeowners on average are paying about $550 annually for hauler services with negligible differences in fees based on cart size. Data provided by the hauler a week ago revealed that most residents contract for large carts. We were pleased that USA Waste and Recycling was able to meet with us recently to share their data about Amherst residential service. They provided us with approximate numbers of customers as well as costs for each cart size. We also learned that weekly pickup of trash is offered regardless of whether customers sign up for weekly or biweekly pickup. Uh, customers who are unable or who don't choose to bring carts to the curb have the option of contracting with a hauler to come to their house uh, to pick up bag trash and recycling bins there, uh, a service that the hauler refers to as boutique. The, the hauler has not provided us with a standard rate for this service, but has reported that the fee starts at $1,000 annually. 200 households or 6% of homeowners are currently choosing this option. Average fees reported for different cart sizes were slightly higher in our survey because some respondents with each cart size are paying these fees that are approximately double the amount that residents who bring their carts and bins to the curb pay. Uh, almost all survey respondents reported contracting for weekly rather than bi-weekly trash pickup. On the other hand, bi-weekly bi recycling is the norm and is used by 19 out of 20 survey respondents. Zero waste advocates note that communities with curbside compost pickup usually are able to implement the opposite arrangement, namely by weekly trash pickup and weekly recycling pickup, since this uh, is effect this more effective in encouraging uh, greater waste reduction. Uh, when food scraps and other compostables are removed from the waste stream, there's much less need for homeowners to put out their trash every week. In summary, homeowners are paying on average $550 annually for waste and recycling pickup. There is virtually no incentive to reduce the, the amount of waste discarded based on cart size since fees are uh, identical or, or quite almost identical for the three sizes. For an additional $2 a month, homeowners can dispose of 64 gallons, which is twice the volume of trash that is contained in a small cart. For an additional four months, $4 a month, it is possible to dispose of 96 gallons of trash, which is three times the volume of the small cart. Uh, customers also pay virtually the same amount regardless of frequency of trash and recycling pickup, whether they have signed up for weekly or biweekly trash pickup. Uh, the lack of incentive to reduce waste based on pickup frequency is partly due to the fact that trash is picked up weekly even if customers contract for biweekly pickup. The data indicates that some customers think they have biweekly service when all customers actually have the ability to put trash out weekly regardless of the pickup frequency they have contracted for. Of the 310 survey respondents, only five are contracting for diversion and disposal of organic materials. So we can safely assume that this optional hauler service is not having a significant waste reduction impact. Uh, our survey gave respondents the opportunity to indicate whether they were satisfied with the hauler's performance. 90% of those who expressed their views were dissatisfied with at least one aspect of their service with 10% commending the hauler for efficiency and, and convenience. 
Uh, one homeowner stated, uh, I, I am frustrated that I have so little choice and have to pay more than I need. There should be incentive and reward for making less trash. Another said, this company gives no discount for seniors and charges for bringing to curb, unlike Amherst Trucking. Yet another remarked that it's rather shameful that Amherst doesn't provide a trash pickup option given how high our taxes are. Another person said it's expensive, but I'm disabled and can't use the transfer station easily. Rates go up every six months, said another. I rarely fill my tra trash container and would throw out even less if I could do curbside comp composting, but I'm not willing to pay them any more per month. Another homeowner shared that I get recycling every two weeks and would be happy to have trash every two weeks as well in order to de decrease truck driving hours. Uh, I love the idea of bundling with access to the town transfer station, another person said. And uh, we were grandfathered for biweekly pickup, but we're not allowed a choice of smaller cart size, said another uh, respondent. This next section of our presentation provides information about use of the town's transfer station. The two left-hand columns of this slide show responses from people who only use the transfer station, while the two columns on the right present the views of those who use both the hauler and, and purchase transfer station passes. Among those who opt out of hauler service in favor of using the transfer station, virtually all cite cost as one of the reasons for doing so. This is understandable since a transfer station sticker costs only $125, which is approximately one quarter of what hauler customers pay. Other advantages reported by sticker holders include access to take it or leave it and the bookshed, uh, the ability to handle their own materials, the opportunity to use dual stream recycling, a dislike of big haulers, and the ability to recycle bulky waste items. Looking at the right-hand columns, we see that cost is not the primary factor motivating homeowners who contract with a hauler uh, and purchase the transfer station stickers as well. For them, the most popular services mentioned were take it or leave it in the bookshed. This slide shows how the transportation is being used now and how past sticker holders have used it. The left-hand column refers to people who currently have this, the transportation stickers, including those who also contract with the hauler. And the right-hand columns is people, uh, are, are, are people who have had stickers in the past. Note that the most used service is dual stream recycling at 81% and that take it or leave it in the book shed, again, are popular with both current and past users. Our survey revealed that ticket holders make trips to the transfer station every other week on the average, 26 times a year, approximately. This, this, uh, uh, and the next slide uh, shows that the majority of pass holders visit the transfer station every other week or slightly less often. So uh, again, the primary motivation for people choosing to opt out of contracting with a hauler and instead using the transfer station is financial savings. One third of respondents who have hauler contracts also purchase transfer station stickers to avail themselves of services that are otherwise unavailable to them. More than 60% uh, more than of transfer station users cited the ability to use dual stream recycling as a reason for purchasing their annual passes. About three quarters of pass holders use the transfer station bi-weekly or less often. Take it or leave it is a service that is highly valued by many transfer station users. Uh, about one third of the transfer station pass holders recycle organic materials there, but less than 2% of homeowners who do not have the transfer station sticker con stickers contract with a hauler for pickup of compostables. This service costs them an additional $15 a month or $180 annually. Uh, finally, the transfer station is clearly valued by many USA customers. Even if we were to have a town contract for hauling, we would continue to need transfer station services. Our survey data and information recently provided by the hauler are in substantial agreement on several counts. First, there is only a small difference charged to customer based on customers based on cart size. The average annual cost for hauler service is $550 when the uh, boutique service customers are included. 
less than 2% of hauler customers opt to pay $180, $180 annually for organics pickup. Uh, hauler pricing varies because some homeowners have been grandfathered in. Uh, some contract for the hauler to pick up trash near their house instead of curbside. However, no senior citizens or, or mean-based discounts are currently offered by the hauler. In summary, USA Waste and Recycling data revealed that pricing difference based on cart size ranging from $42 per month for small carts to $46 for large ones is negligible. Uh, residents who do not wish to or are unable to bring their waste and recycling to the curb pay at least $1,000 annually for pickup near their house. We also learned that the size of the smallest trash carts offered is being increased now from about 32 gallons to 45 gallons. Two years ago, uh, a Zero Waste Amherst member interviewed the South Hadley DPW superintendent to gather details about that town's waste management uh, experience. We learned that the town contracts with Republic for waste removal and dual stream recycling. Homeowners purchase bags for their trash and receive biweekly waste removal service. The South Hadley enterprise free fee is only $125 annually per household for 6,400 households, which is twice the number of households in Amherst. Bag sales are a significant source of revenue for the town. Uh, enterprise fees and bag sales pr provide South Hadley with a total annual revenue of a million three hundred fifty-five three hundred fifty thousand dollars uh, We also obtained data about costs for collection and disposal, 12 twice monthly yard waste and organics collections, in addition to three fall collections and two spring collections amount to a total of $650,000 for those collections. Uh, the total costs for collections, disposal, and the contract with Republic add up to $1,470,000. Uh, listed, listed here are the town provided services in South Hadley, which are similar to those provided in Amherst. Uh, this slide notes th the difference between the cost of the current waste hauling contract in South Hadley for those 6,400 households and the fees collected by USA hauling for 3,200 Amherst residents, which is half the number of households served in South Hadley, the difference is great. The amount that USA collects from Amherst households is actually more than the amount collected by Republic in South Hadley, even though they are serving half as many households. You can also see the difference in annual costs to residents. Finally, uh, Zero Waste Amherst has also surveyed 18 Massachusetts towns with populations comparable to Amherst to learn how other communities are managing their waste. Uh, residents in these towns are charged for waste and recycling management in a variety of ways, including different combinations of taxes, enterprise funds, and pay-as-you-throw bag fees. 12 of these 18 towns provide hauling in-house, five contract with a hauler, and only Amherst has a re resident subscription uh, hauling arrangement. So uh, we appreciate the efforts of the TSO committee to move the ZWA proposed bylaw forward. At this time in the town's history, when we are asking taxpayers to pay on average an additional $468 per year for the new school, wouldn't it be great to be able to give it back in waste hauling savings? Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to share this information with you and, and we'll be happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you, John. And any questions from um, comments? Tony, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you have um, Jennifer Tab, Jennifer Tab, and there's also Susan Waite, and I don't know if you wanted to. Oh um, yeah, bring them in for these comments. Thanks for noticing that, Anika. Yeah, definitely, we could invite them in. Anika, did you want me to do that? Well, they're in my Hi, Jennifer. Welcome. Oh, hi. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for the presentation. 
John. Hi, Susan. Welcome. Hi there. Hmm. Yeah. So, any questions from the committee or observations, comments? Um, yes, Andy. And your mute. Uh, yeah, I got it. I finally was able to get to my mute button. So thank you. And thank you for the presentation, John. Um, I, I guess that there were several things that I thought about as you were presenting. Um, one is that when you and I had that conversation on our own, I raised the question about a survey which uh, was done by asking people to volunteer to respond, I think you get very useful data, but you have to be careful as to whether it's statistically presentable as households. It's only statistically presentable as people who responded, uh, which doesn't make it not valuable because the comments are very helpful, but I just wanted to make that observation. Um, there were several other things that um, I thought about, and I'm hoping that Susan's work with us is going to be able to explore them a little bit more deeply. Because, um, you know, I've thought about this long and hard, and I've talked to people in other communities, not South Hadley, but I did a similar investigation with an Eastern Massachusetts community of about our size that has a lot of experience with, uh, with this issue. And uh, the question of cart size, uh, unfortunately, I'm not sure that it means a lot. And Susan, I'm hoping we'll end up being able to give us a better insight in it because the cost drivers, as I understand uh, what goes on in the hauling business is that their biggest costs are the equipment, the uh, personnel to actually uh, run the routes and work for them, and things like uh, gasoline and uh, uh, just trying to move, the, you know, what, what all of the costs of moving things around, as well as their their administrative piece, and that uh, the only relationship between the size of what they take away and the charge is the tipping fee, which then becomes an important but a relatively smaller part of that whole bundle of costs. And uh, so um, it made me um, curious as to whether um, this uh, division where you have um, relatively small additional charge to have a larger bin whether you use larger bin or not, is really uh, uh, common um, because of those kinds of factors that I was referring to. And uh, the other thing that I, I'd always said, gee, how does South Hadley do it? But if they have bi-weekly, in, in just what I said, it strikes me that bi-weekly is a uh, very, um, big difference because it has your major costs. So I guess those are what my thoughts are on the initial presentation. Um, that said, I want to make it very clear that uh, I still think that uh, having a town uh, run service where we competitively seek uh, bids um, is the best way to move forward because we clearly are not getting a competition. I don't know that we're going to save as much for our uh, residents. And I've been very careful to not make that a prime promise of this. I've been trying to talk about some of the other factors that we've talked about, but not over promise on the uh, cost savings because I'm not sure we can deliver on it. So those are my comments. Go ahead. Darcy, please go ahead. Yeah, I would just say that um, the default 
pickup time in South Hadley is biweekly intentionally because that encourages people to use biweekly. They still can opt to use weekly and pay the additional fee to the um, to the Republic services. So, but by having that be the default and having to pay extra for weekly encourages people to do the bi-weekly. Um, and as John said during the, the presentation, if you remove food scraps from your trash, you can put it out once a year <laughs> because it never smells if you don't have food scraps in it. Um, so uh, that is a consideration when you're when you're removing compost from your trash. Yeah, no, I certainly agree with that because we don't put compost in our trash for that very reason that we do have a backyard bin. Um, as far as the uh, biweekly in South Hadley, when I looked at their rate structure, their charge for getting from going from biweekly to weekly is fairly steep. And I thought about that for a while, and I would wonder if the reason that it's as steep as it is is because they have to run another set of trucks around town for all of those expenses for a relatively small number of households who opt into it. Um, and uh, that makes a, a big difference. And uh, so I'll leave it at that. I guess I'll go next, um, following up on the biweekly, because that was like a little surprising to me. I was like, oh my God, I, can, I can't throw my trash out weekly. That's weird. But then you just clarify that when you don't have the composting, it, you know, there's no reason because it, I don't have enough trash. So, but I was just curious though, is that becoming more of a best practice to do, there are two questions around best practices. One is, is biweekly a bet, you know, a, moving towards a better practice for the goals that we have. And my second question around that, which came up a lot in your presentation was the dual stream. And do we know whether dual stream is better than single stream? Um, because I do know that what we just learned, uh, you know, full disclaimer, we We've been talking with people and different stakeholders, just like we hear from you. We also met with uh, U.S. Trucking, USA Trucking, and one of the things we learned was in terms of the types of plastics. So that was, I mean, to me, that's helpful to know that when we are asking haulers, you know, what are you going to accept for recycling? And what we heard was that they are willing to take plastic number five or so that's more than what is generally taken. So all of these things are just helping educating us in terms of what is the maximum we can recycle. Um, so just coming back to that question, is biweekly uh, a better practice? And then do we know for sure whether dual stream is better than single stream? And maybe Susan, if you want to... Uh, Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, let me think about this for a moment. Um, I just got back from a conference in Marlboro, so my brain is a little tired. Um, oh, I don't mean to put you on a spot. Do you need a few? No, more? no. Uh, the the dual stream one is very easy to answer. I'm just kind of formulating uh, the so dual stream recycling yields an extremely high quality product. You don't get broken plastic shards mixed in with your paper. You don't get broken glass mixed in with your paper. Um, it is the reason why Amherst is able to, uh, to not belong to the Springfield Murph because Sunoco um, is happily willing to take their paper because it's dual stream paper. Sunoco does not like single stream paper if they can help it, right? So um, it's it's easy to find buyers for single for dual stream material, and um, that being said, uh, well, and also uh, we are very fortunate to have a dual stream MRF at the in the Springfield MRF. They sell um, most of their product is sold domestically. Um, some of it is after it's sold is shipped overseas by the middle people, but um, 
A lot of it is processed here in the United States. And again, they've never had a problem um, finding buyers. They might have had a problem, especially after Chinese sword, um, getting a great price because the market was down, but they've always been able to sell their material. So, um, but dual stream MRFs are a dying breed. I will be completely honest with you. Most MRFs that are being built are single stream MRFs. Um, the technology is getting better for single stream MRFs. They are able to sort and, and remove contamination better and better, but it's still not great. And there's also, of course, the risk of more contamination because having one bin and throwing everything in it um, has a tendency to attract more trash. People do wish cycling. Um, and so I wanna share with you just um, the, the Springfield MRF just recently released five different videos that I really encourage you all to check out. Um, the first one is a, it's an overview video called Me and My Bin that was, um, that it's, it's, it's designed in part for a somewhat younger audience, but it's a really well done uh, piece of work. And then there are four other videos and all of these videos are about six minutes or uh, six to seven minutes long. Uh, there are four other videos on specific topics. One is on container recycling, one is on paper recycling, one is on wish cycling or putting stuff in the bin that you hope or think should be recycled even though it isn't. And, and then the fourth is on what happens to the products after they leave the MRF. So they're really um, nicely done pieces that I encourage you all to watch. So when you say, is dual stream better than single stream? In many ways it is, yes. As far as by finding buyers, um, it is. Um, that being said, the, there, are, there are very few dual stream facilities left in the United States. And it was interesting because I was looking at a sustainability report from Waste Management Recycles America, which is the company that the Mass DEP contracts with to run the Springfield MRF. And um, in their sustainability port report, I found out that they only operate two dual stream MRFs in the United States. And one of them is ours in Springfield. So the fact that a major a multinational company like Waste Management Recycles America um, is willing to continue operating a dual stream facility, even given that the, the trend is to move towards single stream, means that it's economically viable. It means that they, it's, a, it's a good operation and they're willing to continue doing it. So, um, that to me speaks volumes. Um, let me think, did I have anything else to add about single stream? Oh, yes, just found out the city of Holyoke had, had been a Smurf community for many years. And in 2020, I think when they, when the Murph first came out with their new contract, they uh, went single stream. And I just learned yesterday or the day before that the city of Holyoke is going back to dual stream. They do their uh, self haul and um, they are going to be picking up dual stream again. Um, I don't know the start date. I think it, I mean, I'm not sure what the details are, but um, there are other communities after the Chinese sword that also went back to collecting dual stream. Um, because of various reasons, but mostly that they they wanted to make sure that they had a higher quality product. We're lucky because in Western Mass, a lot of our residents have already been trained to do dual stream. And so it's not a hardship for people. They just, they just know, and it makes sense to keep them separated. I mean, why would you want um, a salad dressing bottle um, thrown in the same container as your computer paper? You know, um, it just doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense in a lot of ways, but that being said, um, for efficiency sake, et cetera, the trend is definitely to go single stream. So with regard to your uh, other question. Bi-weekly. Is, is bi-weekly uh, moving towards better practice? So cart size, um, cart size, Mass DEP has data that shows, and I can share, 
um, charts with with you all. Um, year after year, it's clear that the larger cart that you have, the more trash you produce. We have, um, you can all go online and find the, the data yourself. They have, I don't know, maybe something like eight years worth of data from our annual waste and recycling survey that's done from something like 260, 80 communities in, in Massachusetts. So we have the data and we and it's clear that the larger cart size you have, um, the more trash you produce. With the pay as you throw program, um, it's really uh, key for MassDEP. Uh, you're supposed to have a garbage can size no larger than 35 gallons. And it needs, if it's picked up weekly, if it's picked up biweekly, then a 64 gallon cart is acceptable. So um, when, you know, it, it kind of, the, the weekly versus biweekly kind of depends on the size of the cart and um, it depends on the community and, and what's going on. So, um, and, and of course you have to think about um, the, the fuel and emissions, et cetera, you know, based on the frequency. So um, with an official pay as you throw program, can be cart based if it's if the trash cart is 35 gallons or less and it's only picked up weekly or if it's picked up bi-weekly and it's 64 gallons so it's possible that south hadley i have to look to see i think that they're pays you throw community so that might be why they're being picked up bi-weekly because they wanted to have 64 gallon carts um haulers tend to prefer 64 gallon carts um i'm not I'm not clear on all the reasons why, um, but their preference is 64 gallon carts, but MassDEP encourages municipalities to push back on that because uh, of the data that clearly demonstrates that the larger carts you have, the more trash is produced. It's like, it's like if you're going on a trip and you have a huge suitcase, you know, are you gonna fill the suitcase more than you would if you had a smaller suitcase? Sure you would. Or if you go to an all you care to eat groceries, uh, a go all you care to eat restaurant, and you've got um, a big plate versus a small plate, um, it's just it's a, it's human nature. You want to fill it. Absolutely, yeah. There's tons of research on that around food. The bigger mm -hmm. bowls, you eat more. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, thank you. Any other questions, Jennifer? Um, thank you. Yeah, and you asked um, the questions I had, uh, particularly about dual versus single stream. So um, even though a sponsor, I'm still learning as we move along. Um, but I, I did have a question because um, I also um, met with um, USA yesterday, and um, there was you know a lot of discussion around uh, different types of billing. And I was wondering if, um, I don't know if this is part of, I guess my question is to Paul, part of what Susan will be doing, but um, is, you know, if, if part of um, our preparation for the RFI is to look internally at, you know, what kind of um, billing system we think we would prefer is, I don't know if that's something that um, Susan would do or other staff, but. So, so one of the questions is who does the billing, right? That would be an RFI. So we, we can say the town does it. And then what's the cost of doing that? We can say whoever gets the bid does the billing we don't we're not involved in that so that's a question that we would pose during the rfi it's like which do you prefer and offer that to the um, companies and say tell us what you think about that and then we would discuss that internally you know before we went for the rfp exactly we, exactly okay. yeah thank you dorothy Okay, I have two questions. Um, is Amherst the only town where the town plays no role in the curbside pickup and individuals have their own contract? That's a question. Is that, is that directed to me? Yes, please. Yeah, okay. Can you can you ask it again? I'd want to make sure I'm understanding it correctly. Um, okay. Is Amherst the only town? 
I've, I've got to start off this phone. It's killing me. Okay. I, I don't know how is the only me. town where the town is not where the, where, the, where the town is not involved at all in the curbside pickup. We know that Northampton is also. Yeah. Yes. Belcher town. Yep. yep. Right. There, there, are, there are many towns in Western Massachusetts where the, the, uh, there is the, the town is not involved in curbside service. Absolutely. Especially in the Berkshires. Um, <clears throat> so uh, mo many communities in my district have transfer stations that are municipally uh, run mm. and and the curbside service is considered subscription where they they can based on the number of haulers who are offering curbside service they can contract on their own for a curbside hauler so there are there are definitely communities that um, have the same model uh, with <clears throat> with the exception of of Northampton most of them are much smaller than Amherst's Okay, because I'll tell you one thing that confused me because uh, we go straight, we just use the transfer station in my house. So I don't have personal experience with the haulers. But when I got here, I began to be aware of these things. We had several companies doing it. And when all of a sudden it became just one company, um, I guess I thought the others had gone out of business or whatever. And then I find that they're operating in other towns. So I'm just kind of curious as to how this monopoly came about. Yeah, no, in, they're not um, operating in other towns. The um, it's funny because I um, I joked with Eric Fredrickson, who's from USA Waste, when I first met him, and I said, um, it it makes me sad that we've lost our local haulers, but I have to hand it to your business development people. They they like are amazingly smart because. Well, essentially what happened was we had private haulers and it just so happened that most of them were of or nearing retirement age. And so USA Waste um, purchased Duso Trucking, Amherst Trucking and um, Alternative Recycling Services. So those three companies are not operating anywhere oh, in, okay. in, in the Pioneer Valley. There are pieces of those companies that were not purchased by USA. So you might hear about um, um, alternative recycling services because they run Hadley's transfer station, but they no longer do hauling, um, uh, at least curbside pickup. Okay, so the Republic, see, I didn't even know the names of who they were since we didn't, we weren't involved with them. So Republic was not one of the uh, companies that used to serve Amherst. Oh no, no, they were they were small regional um, haulers, and uh, USA in their um, uh, they had I, I like I say they've got a brilliant 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 business development person. Um, I mm -hmm. I couldn't have done a better job because, um, yeah, I mean it was a great really great business opportunity, and I right. applaud them for thinking yeah. of it. They were smart. Because Republic charges much less money, and so that was of, of interest to me. Um, it was quite. Well, it a bit depends left. on the community, right? I mean, Republic has contracts with communities all over, so um, mm -hmm. it just depends on the services you get. And you know, um, I can't say that Republic charges less because there's it's you have to compare an apple to an apple, and I'm not clear mm -hmm. that that's being done. Okay, thank you. Um, since Andy, you've already had a chance, could be here, Anika first. Anika, go ahead. Ah, okay, sorry, I thought I was muted. Uh, so thank you uh, for your presentation and um, acquiring so many responses. I know that's not always um, easy to do. And, um, you know, for providing us with that information, I had just a couple, well, I have a, two questions. One is clarifying. So. You had mentioned, unless I, I may have heard wrong, that there were 6,400 households somewhere and that that was double the amount of households in, in Amherst. So maybe I heard wrong, um, if maybe you could clarify that. And the majority of my comments, or I, I can pause if someone, if you wanna go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I, that was just the slide that compared the South Hadley services with Amherst services. They, their Republic services um, 
6,400 households in South Hadley, and we were comparing their numbers to the 3,200 that are, are um, uh, serviced by USA in Amherst. Okay, thank you. And then, um, so the rest of my comments were covered really between Andy and Shalini, but I had just one other, and this might be personal to me and certainly, you know, not in, de in defense of any company, but I just would caution us sometimes when we say monopoly, if that's an, an opinion. I, you know, as um, a, a business owner had, you know, something similar happened to me in regards to my signs and, and signature and were kind of taken and put into like a, a, a bigger uh, company and in the, in the interim had really erased a, a business and a black business. And thankfully we have the internet that doesn't allow that to happen as much, but I'm just, I was under the impression that the, that zero waste had accumulated other businesses because they wanted to sell to zero waste that they were, um, sorry, I didn't mean to say zero waste, mm -hmm. USA that they wanted to sell to USA because they were a, a family business or in consideration of their customers as opposed to a monopoly. So I don't know if that was the the intent in there or, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, Sarah. I would just say that uh, uh, I think by monopoly, we just mean that they're the only hauler in license to do residential hauling in Amherst. Mm. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that, Anika, because I just heard Sue, and that was, I think that is the understanding I had too, that this is a monopoly, but my understanding, especially as Susan also just clarified that the two businesses were going out of business and they bought over and it's like anyone can come and bid or anyone can enter the town of Amherst, they're not choosing to yet. So, but we should not imply that it is, um, it's a uh, monopoly being created by a particular company. Yeah, or even just clear clarity on what that means. So yeah, I- Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Andy, did you wanna? Yeah, I, I guess a uh, follow up on that last point first though. Uh, our, current bylaw process provides that any hauler can um, choose to go to DPW or is really running it, even though it says Board of Health and Regulation, and DPW um, can license any hauler that's interested in picking up um, trash in marketing its services within Amherst. And uh, when we met with USA Trucking, you know, one of the points that they made was, well, why are you um, convinced that uh, competition is helpful? Because nobody's competing with us right now. And uh, I guess that I think that's something that TSO needs to talk about when we get into the nitty gritty of this, because I actually um, am not necessarily in favor of having multiple companies competing to pick up um, in Amherst because everyone that comes is another set of trucks that's running up and down the streets causing pollution. And um, I'm not sure that it's an economically sound model to have three or four companies all competing um, with each other and therefore the competition that would make the most sense if you're trying to use uh, the competition as the mechanism to get the lowest price is to have one townwide competition and I think that's what we're um, exploring um, because uh, in the end aside, uh, aside from the fact that I'm not sure that we get any gain I think that we really have an interest in, uh, I know that uh, when John 
who's working on the recycling refuse management plan. That's one of the things we heard a lot about was um, people complaining about how two or three different companies coming down your street would spend an awful lot of trash trucks coming down your street for, and it seemed like uh, even back then when people were not as conscious of the, eco uh, the ecological impact of that, there was still complaints about it then, so it would only be worse now. So, um, going back to South Hadley, though, one of the things that USA Trucking also put in, and I couldn't figure this out, I actually spent a little bit of time this morning trying to explore the South Hadley budget uh, on their website, which is not an easy document to follow. Makes me very much appreciate our own budget and how <laughs> How easy it is to follow our budget, uh, but uh, the, the um, assertion was that um, there were some costs were being picked up by the town, and that that was supplementing what the homeowners were being charged, and therefore you uh, have to be careful of how you compare those costs. And I don't know if in your exploration of South Hadley. If you picked up anything um, that Ill is, um, adds to that, or whether Susan knows anything that might either um, substantiate that statement that was made or provide a counter to it, but um, I couldn't get anything by looking at the budget to see if I could find a budget line because their budget is so Mac, you know, um, they do have a uh, budget for. Uh, the trash hauling so that we know that they're supplementing the costs out of the town budget, but we don't know for what purposes. Um, so I guess that's the, uh, um, and, and then the last thing I'll come back to um, was my prior question about whether there's any break in this is Susan, if she can answer it. If not, I'll drop it for now, whether there's any breakdown generally about uh, trash hauling and what is the typical breakdown of various costs that go into running that kind of a business. And can I just uh, alert everyone to the time that we promised Chief Livingstone and uh, Anika, if you want to just let us know where we are on time. Uh, we are there with time, but please, if, um, if Susan, if you can answer, uh, if, if you have time to answer, um, Andy's question, or if you can, and then I do believe that um, John, you had your hand up before, so if we can, I'll, you know, I'll yeah, I'll defer to Susan. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I um, uh, I've been speaking with South Hadley uh, recently about other issues, and I can certainly um, ask some questions and come back to you with some information. Andy also asked for a typical breakdown of costs for services. That's the kind of thing I think that I can get fairly easily. I do want to explain that South Hadley um, was in a unique situation because they had been the host of a landfill for many years. And um, as part of that host agreement, they got free tipping um, tipping services and, and a bunch of other stuff for free. And so their residents were used to not having to pay anything for trash. So when they migrated to having a townwide hauler, they had to be very careful with how much they were charging um, because it, it, it's, it, they had to do it. It's, it. it's a transitional kind of thing. And um, so I'm not I'm not aware of them subsidizing, but it's very possible that they did in in part because to ease that transition because people for you know 15 years or something like that had been getting uh, their trash services for free. Thank you so and much. I will, I will check into some of your other questions and see what I can find for you. Thank you. Can we uh, also invite people to send over the questions? You can send them to me and I can always forward them to Susan and to Zero Waste if we need to wrap up soon. That's Anika, a great idea. Uh, yes, we do. We can allow uh, um, Darcy, or, Darcy and Dorothy and then we will end.
Yeah, I just have a quick, quick answer to to Andy's question, and it was on. It was actually on the slide with the comparison um, that the the South Hadley revenue that comes in comes from their yearly resident fee, plus they they have get five hundred and fifty thousand dollars from sale of their bags, and that completely covers the cost of the hauler contract. They do have additional costs for the transfer station staff, et cetera. But as far as the contract itself, that it completely covers it. Okay, and that includes the disposal and everything you're saying. Right, yes, yeah, yes. Everything. you okay. can read about okay. it in the Hanser Gazette. <laughs> Thank you, Darcy. And Dorothy? Just a comment that I'm, I'm glad that I received some good clarification today that the previous companies uh, went out of business um, and asked to be take, taken over and we're very happy to be taken retired, over. Retired. Uh, yeah. Retired. And mm -hmm. I'm also very uh, in agreement with Andy that I think we do not want to have competing trucks going up and down the streets. When we did have more trucks here, I was I did comment at a town council meeting at the ridiculousness of these huge monster trucks going up and down residential streets. So I think that uh, what Andy's described sounds like a, a kind of like I hope the way we're going, which is um, trying to do a competitive bidding, townwide bidding, and then selecting the one company that would do the best job for Amherst. So I, I you know for me this has been a really informative meeting. So and thank you, thank you, Susan. You've been very helpful. Yeah. And thank you, John and Darcy and Jennifer and, and Paul, just before we wrap up, I don't know if you have an update for us about uh, the staff person who would be uh, designated. Is that, has it been decided yet? It was going to be Guilford morning until you hear otherwise. Okay, got it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you all thank so you. much for all the valuable work you're doing in the, in our community. Thank you, Darcy, Jennifer, and yeah, I'll John. zoom out. Thank you for letting me join. Thank you for joining. <laughs> Thanks. So I'll be zapped out. Oh, I guess I I'll do it. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. That's funny. <laughs> okay. If we could please welcome back Chief Livingstone and thank you for being patient with us. I feel like I didn't set a timer. Scott, I'm, or Paul, were you able to text? Um, okay, thank you. You, need to you guys looking for me? We're yeah, looking for you. Sir. Yes, indeed. There was some basketball being played. Who was playing? Oh, were you playing? Don't mention no. it. I'm I'm taping the games. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No were you rooting for UConn or were you rooting for Kansas State? March Madness. I'm not even talking about it. <laughs> the, the correct answer would be UConn in that. Scenario. Yeah, it's a blue state. <laughs> I won't say anything. Good. <laughs> Well, thank you right. for being with us. We're here to revisit the um, surveillance use policy uh, because Mandy Joe's questions that had been submitted um, prior to our ask, uh, I guess two weeks ago now, uh, were not included. And um, if I'm correct, uh, both Paul and Chief Livingstone, you both have them and um, would you like to, is there anything you'd like to, to walk us through or explain? Yeah, so I can start. And uh, there are basically, the way I understand, Mandy had four points that she had brought to our attention. Um, and some of them apply to the policy and some of them apply to the police directive, which is something that the chief issues, right? Do you have them in front of you, Scott? Yeah, I have um, most of Mandy Joe's um, emails, including the questions and some of her potential motions to, an, to amend the policy. Perfect. And of course, i pretty knowledgeable about our policy. So do you want to go through them one? The, I think we should focus, if that's okay with everybody, the, on the motions to amend the policy, because I think that's what she was focused on. She sort of 
um, reduced everything to an actual what would be changed in the policy. So I think that was very helpful. Do you want to go through them one by one? Sure. Um, and I'm assuming all you guys have this in front of you as well. Or do you want to share this? Does everyone have them? I'm not sure that we yeah. do. When, we get, I, when did we receive? It's not in the packet. That it's not in the SharePoint. I don't. I haven't looked at the town. Okay. It's not there either. Is it, is it an email from Mandy Joe on March twentieth to? Um. Yeah. So hold on. Let me find it. Yes. No. So I mean, I can. Most of what Mandy Jo is proposing for her amendments while, while Paul gets that up is pretty easy to do, except for the last. She has one, two, three bullet items specific to language add-ons for our policy. And um, the first two are really easy to do. The third one is not um, because it involves very specific language that would not be doable for us. Okay, we look at the right thing here. Yes. So the first one, Scott, is this one? Yeah. So let me just make sure it's the one I'm reading as well. So yeah, that's that's not a bit, that's not a, um, an issue at all. The only thing is, um, it, it might be easier just to eliminate the entire language that speaks to special events. And the the reason I'm saying that is because first of all, I don't know if it's ever been used where an um, in car video system has been used to document a, a special event. We put that in there, um, and don't forget, we've been using NCAR video systems for, I think, 25 years. Mm -hmm. And so we put that in in case there was a time where an officer went to a really large noise disturbance, like when the entire street was taken over, in order for them to videotape that, in, course, in case we had to go to court to show you know, the courts what it actually looked like from an officer's perspective. So it wouldn't necessarily be used for an individual specifically where it would for like an OUI arrest or something like that. So that was that special event clause was put in there in the event that we needed to use that, just an overview of what the street looked like. Um, and I'm not even sure if we've ever actually used that to be honest with you. So, um, you know, maybe I, you know, I, I don't want to say it's never been used because I'm not 100% sure, but it, if it was used, it was rare. So, um, you know, I'm not even sure if that needs to be in our policy and or in the town um, bylaw to, to include that. And that's a discussion we can have uh, with Mandy Jo. If, if she wants to include that, we can have more discussion on that. So I think the question was, should this be, I mean, I think she's saying it should be in the directive, not in the, not in the surveillance use policy that, but that require you to say, yes, I'm going to put this in the directive. Yeah. Um, because when in her question part of it, she, there's some very specific language. She, she asked about it. Um, so she gets in, like, should they be activated during other stops? That occur occur I'm near. I'm sorry here. to I'm sorry to interrupt, but here she is. Okay, so this might be able to help if we have if we have any questions. Mandy, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, I can hear you. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's so much better. <laughs> <laughs> well, that saves us some time, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, the the part, Mandy, Joe, where. Um, you and your actually in your actual questions about the the policy um, bullet item number two, where you ask, should they be activated during other stops that occur near vehicles or pedestrian disturbances on public ways, outdoor noise complaints, or 
the, the uh, or others question mark um i have concerns about how we would put that into a language whether it be for the policy or for the bylaw because it's too it's too vague it's too general um we like specifics obviously um and i don't know how we would make the wording fit so that officers understood exactly what they were supposed to do. Yeah, um, I would just say it's kind of in it now, which is why my question was there. And, and you know, I don't know whether the better thing to do is to delete that paragraph that's in the directive or try to make it less, make yeah. it more specific. That That was my concern. Like, do you want to use it? And if so, make it more specific and if you don't want that authority then maybe just delete the paragraph yeah and the more i read it the more i thought about it the more i wanted to delete it because um it's just it's it's just too general and too vague to accommodate probably what everybody would like it to say and what it would like to what more specifically what it would mean right um because it's not good for either party, whether it's the police or the public, to have general general references, that sort of thing. Um, so I can certainly clarify that and maybe even just delete it from the, um, the from our policy about using it. Because again, if it has been used, it's been extremely rare when it's been used. And it was initially put in there as a mechanism to just show an overall, like for instance, this past Blarney, there was a street, South Whitney Street, where we probably could have used it just to show the sheer volume of people that were in the street, but it wouldn't have been for a specific, you know, John Doe got arrested and here's the picture of it. You know what I mean? So that would be, I think better if we just deleted it from the from the uh, policy so are you talking about are you saying re, re, revise this we call it the direct your directive i think it's called um, yeah. the police policy and, and you would revise that exactly that and, and that's not unusual because we review most policies annually and most of the major ones annually and all of them are reviewed at least every three years when we do our accreditation review Um, I think there was another question in bullet item number two, you are bullet item number one. You had a question about what, um, stops that occur near vehicles. All right. We did that one. Oh, what's the difference between a traffic stop and an enforcement activity and a special event. So the special event is what we would eliminate. Traffic stops are very specific to a traffic vehicle stop where an officer views a <laughs> chapter 90 violation, right? So a speeding stop sign violation, anything that refers to chapter 90. An enforcement activity is anything where an officer would make a vehicle stop that isn't witnessed necessarily by the officer. So we get a call for somebody just robbed a bank and they're leave, leaving in a black Volvo we wouldn't necessarily see the robbery, but we would know we're looking for a black Volvo. We would stop that. Or more specifically, what's happening almost on a daily basis now is somebody is driving down the street and they call 911 because there's a road rage incident or somebody's tailgating them or somebody passed them in a no passing zone. So people call us almost daily and say, yeah. Yeah. this guy's following me. Um, he's tailgating me. I need an officer to come stop this guy. So an officer will respond and we won't necessarily see the violation, but we'll stop them and see. Then a lot of times they'll say things like, he seems like he's impaired or he or she is impaired. So an officer, officer will make that stop and ascertain what's going on with the vehicle. So that sort of thing. So you have a vehicle stop that is witnessed by an officer for a chapter 90 violation and then something else that is called in for a more specific uh, request for a stop. Uh, 
Um, and the last one, please clarify what considerations are not allowed when determining whether to activate. Um, so if we eliminate the special events clause, I think that would answer that question. It would be very specific when an officer would be recording and it would be any time the act, the blue lights would be activated. Does that make sense? Or did I just confuse everybody? Mandy Joe has her hand up, Anika. Mandy, please, sorry. That makes sense. Um, I just had a question about enforcement activities. What you described sounds basically like traffic violations or other violations, but not observed by the officers. Is there a way to define that better within the directive? Because, you know, I read that and I said, is that like any enforcement activity not even related to motor vehicles? So still. Um, it kind of is any activity not related. So yeah, I could research that more. Um, obviously, most, well, all of our, all of our policies are governed by, through um, the mass accreditation um, commission. So they have to be approved by them. So we're not the only police entity that uses these. So I can review other departments and see how specific they get into that and certainly make changes as appropriate. Um, you know, this policy was reviewed last year when we received uh, reaccreditation. Um, if there was concerns by the, and it's a most, mostly civilian commission that oversees this now. Um, if there were concerns, they would have brought it up, but that doesn't mean they wouldn't have missed something. So um, I can certainly look more directly and be more specific about what types of stops that would involve. Criminal activity, concerns with the public, that sort of thing. The things that we specifically respond to now, we can incorporate that. You know, the biggest concern I had was trying to adapt a policy that would be inclusive of the special and special events wording. That would be really hard to do. You know, I, I know you had asked a question about responding to noise complaints with 100 plus people and you know that would be really di difficult to kind of meld into our policy. Mandy? Yeah, um, the only other thing is when that gets fixed, I think some of the proposed potential motions to amend, I talked mm -hmm. about which the use policy or the directive that the use policy would govern. Um, with the enforcement activities listed in the directive, I think it still conflicts with the use policy that says on, and I'm trying to pull it up. Um, let's see if I can get it up quick. Um, the very first part purpose of the use policy um, technology is to document through audio and video recordings all motor vehicle traffic stops for those marked police vehicles that have it. Yet the directive has these enforcement activities along with traffic stops. So my, I guess my only other concern is that seemingly contradiction. Um, it's not necessarily a contradiction, but the directive goes a little bit further than the use policy. And so clearing, you know, sort of fixing that, that, that disconnect. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to read it real quick. Um, it might be easier if I just sit down with, with Captain Young and Lieutenant Daly who oversee our accreditation process and just pick out some wording and then get it back to the town council and see if that fits. Um, is there urgency on when we're voting on this for in the entirety or? Uh, so I appreciate that. I I think that, you know, you can take the time. Our next meeting, let me just confirm here. 
sorry, just one moment. Our next meeting will be um, April 20th. Oh, Andy yeah. Did, um, but let, let me just pause for Andy in case I'm misspeaking. Andy. Yeah, I guess I just have one concern on what we're talking about, unless I'm misunderstanding. And that is that it's always been uh, the wisdom of how you do this, that the bylaw um, is more general so that you don't be, and the specifics are in the, the use policy. And I want to make sure that we don't do anything to amend the bylaw that then makes it um, more difficult for you to be responding or your successor to be responding during the accreditation process to the needs to change policies. Uh, we don't want you to then have to come back to the council, to, to a future council on an amendment of the, uh, of this bylaw in order to just uh, make it possible for you to do what you need to do to change a policy that you need to change for accreditation purposes. Uh, yeah, thanks for that, Andy. Um, I think probably where the biggest difference of opinion, or maybe not, it's a dip, not a difference of opinion, but the biggest concern is this to me is the special event clause because everything else is very specific when it involves the stopping of vehicles, which is 99.9% .9 of what the in-car video system is designed to do. Um, you know, again, we, we put that clause in for special events, basically to help ourselves, right? To, in the, in the case, where we came upon an, an incident where there was an extremely large number of people who had taken over a street. Um, we were able to document that to show to a court in the event, because it was back in the early 80s when we, most of the really troublesome times were at Hobart Lane. Um, you know, there'd be thousands of kids in the street. And we'd make arrests for things like, you know, failure to disperse for a riot, those sort of things. We needed to be able to document something. And that was a mechanism we had. Now, that doesn't happen that much anymore. It's not to say it wouldn't happen, but um, we've educated the court systems. We've educated the, certainly educated the university about what our concerns are. So there are other mechanisms now to, when we bring somebody before a court jurisdiction to show that they're, you know, this is the reason that we had to make an arrest or this is the reason we had to charge somebody with a TBL violation, that sort of thing. So I'm not as concerned about the special event language. Um, the other language is pretty straightforward and we can be more specific, Mandy Joe, to fit that so that we can document all the other reasons that we would make a car stop aside from a chapter 90 incident. Just so people know, TBL means town by law yes. violation. Thank you. Mandy. Yeah, um, the purpose amendment might be easy to fix to conform to the directive, but I wanted to, uh, and you asked about timing, and I know I don't sit on TSO, but the bylaw says that if the council doesn't act on the use policy within 180 days, it automatically becomes adopted. So that 180 days is sometime in early June, I believe, because um, I think it was referred in December. Yeah. So that that's that would be a timing potential timing thing to watch out for. Okay. So if a April 20th, Anika is the the next meeting. I'm very confident we would have the we would have the wording in place, even if I have to have a, you know, just an individual, and I don't know if that's allowed, but an individual meeting with either yourself or the TSO group or uh, including Mandy Joe to make that wording fit. I'm not I'm not overly concerned that we couldn't get this done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for working with us and we'll yeah. you know, figure out all of the, the specifics, how, how we do it so we can meet with you. Um, 
and again, I appreciate you taking this time at night and, and thank you, Mandy, as well for coming in, I'm sure after a long day joining us. Thank you. Um, and so, so love it if you want to stay, I'm sorry, go ahead, Paul. So this will be on the agenda for April 20th. Is that the goal? And then they have a revi revisions uh, back to the count by the TSO the week prior to that. Yes. Okay. Got it. Thank you. And Thanks. so just one question, Anika. So when I start formulating wording changes, should I direct those to you or to the TSO group or to Mandy Joe or how, uh, do you want to that? how about, how about you send them to me and then I can okay. share them with um, the chair and the, the maker of the, the person you know, to Mandy Joe. Does that make sense to everybody? Perfect. That'll Is that work. Okay, Nika. Okay. Yes, that works. Thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, it would be it would be helpful to get them in the packet um, prior to if that's possible. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Sure. Thank you, Scott and Mandy Jill. You're welcome to stay with us. <laughs> I'll go ahead and enjoy your Thank meeting. you for inviting me in. I'm going to leave the meeting to come <laughs> to the TSO. I appreciate your willingness to have me, though. Thank you. Well, great night. Okay. All right, so we've about come to our end here. Has everyone had a chance to look at the minutes that were included? I did send them off. Did everyone have a chance to look through? Dorothy? Um, no, I just wanted to say what a good job uh, is being done on the minutes. I guess we should say thank you, Kelly. And- um, Absolutely, thank you, Kelly. It's also nice, you know, when we have a meeting where we're dealing mainly with one, topic so because i actually can pick the top tso the date and the topic of the minutes is it's a really good record better than my notes so thank you i really appreciate that thank you so much for your kind words <laughs> we appreciate you so do we have a motion to approve i so move a second Okay, so we're moving to approve the minutes for March 2nd and March 9th, 2023. Anna. Aye. Shalini. Abstain. Andy. Aye. Dorothy. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So because that's four yes, one abstention. Okay, uh, are there any announcements to make? I guess I should announce real quickly that the um, traffic uh, safety committee met um, earlier this evening and uh, the traffic advisory committee and uh, they talked about the street lighting um, proposal again and came up with a resolution, I think, uh, which is basically that um, without uh, I can't give it to you exactly. This isn't a formal presentation. It's just a liaison report to the committee that is most interested in it. Um, that uh, they agree with the, uh, they, they want to endorse the, um, sky, the, the, the skylighting issue um, to try and reduce, it, but they also um, want to emphasize um, safety issues, and so they're working on a resolution to that effect. Um, but I think that's kind of what we expected. And uh, the um, other issue that they're working on is to would be getting something back to us representing the council, and that has to do with uh, bicycle routes, safe bicycle routes, and trying to map out new policy on that, or new mapping structure on that. Thank you, Andy. Dorothy? Um, I just wanted to say, and this is particularly, I want I want Paul to, to hear this one, um, that we had uh, occasion to use the uh, EMTs last Saturday night, and they were great. They were wonderful and uh, just totally professional. Um, so um, I, I haven't gotten around to coming out with a, a, a thank you letter, but I just wanted you to know how well they did. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy and, and Paul. And uh, District 3 and 4 had a neighborhood walk last night that was quite interesting. And I will uh, we'll have some notes compiled that I will we'll share 
with you all at our next meeting. District 5 came. They just missed the walk. We That's went right. on walk. Yep, yep. <laughs> District 5 was there as well in spirit. I missed the kickoff of the walk, and so I took my dog on a nice little walk around town, which was lovely. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Yeah. Actually, could we have a walk? I still don't even know which is the new District 5. Like, how far yeah. does it go? Oh, it goes right up to town. Yeah, we can definitely walk it. We should yeah. definitely do that. Okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you the information. So right now we're, you know, have, we've kicked this off at, at uh, three and four until the clock strikes midnight and changes that. Um, but we'll definitely share that info. And so we also had no items and we have nothing that was not anticipated. Thank you all for this uh, meeting and being here and we are adjourned. Thank you. Good night. Good night.